good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending today's webinars and many facets of early phase evaluation of psychedelics in psychiatry, a roadmap to studying safety, abuse, potential, and efficacy. My name is Nathalie Dubois. I'm part of the marketing team at Signature Discovery, and I will be your host today for this webinar. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to quickly cover a few housekeepings. So we're on Zoom, I'm sure you already know how to use it, but if you have any technical issues, please contact us via the chat function and we'll try to help as best as we can. Should be at the bottom of your screen. If you've missed uh, last webinar, which was with Beatrice and Andy, uh, check both Alpha Science or Signature's uh, website and you'll be able to get the on-demand version. So let's begin. Today we have Dr. Sharon Cheatham from Signature Discovery and Dr. Beatrice Technik from Alta Sciences. So Sharon is the director of the In Vivo Pharmacology at Signature and visiting professor at the University of Nottingham. She has many years of experience working in the CNS field from obesity treatment to abuse assessment. She started a scientific career at the Institute of Psychiatry, University of London, working in the field of epilepsy with Professor Brian Meldrum. She went on to the St. George Hospital Medical School to study neurotransmitter and their receptor in post-mortem brain from depressed suicide victims with Professor Roger Oden. Sharon's transition from academia to industry by joining the CNS group at Boots Pharmaceutical, which became BSF Pharma, where she did a team investigating CNS approaches to treat obesity. Beatrice is the Chief Scientific Officer at Alta Sciences and is also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. She has been working in the area of clinical drug development and abuse potential assessment for more than 16 years. She earned a doctorate degree in pharmacology and the collaborative program in neuroscience from the University of Toronto. She has published numerous research articles in internationally recognized peer reviewed journals and is a recognized expert in the field of human abuse and physical dependence potential, potential evaluation. So today's talk, um, the many facets of early phase evaluation of psychedelics in psychiatry, a roadmap to studying safety, abuse potential and efficacy. We will have a Q&A at the end, but we invite you to submit any question you may have throughout the webinar using the Q&A function available. It should be again at the bottom of your screen. So we hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and I'm gonna leave it to Beatrice to start. Over to you. Thank you, Natalie. And welcome to our session. Uh, during today's webinar, we will cover the regulatory requirements that pertain to the development of psychedelics for targeted therapeutic indications. We will also review the importance of abuse potential evaluation, the drug scheduling process, and why these are critical considerations, even very early in your drug development process. The types of preclinical and clinical studies and the best timing for the, the approach will be reviewed. And we will also cover how to strategically navigate your early data collection to gain the most insight into the profile of your drug candidate. And lastly, we will discuss the challenges and ways forward in handling a Schedule One controlled substance in drug trials. Next, please. First, let's start by defining the term psychedelic, which was coined in 1957 by the British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond. The term psychedelic describes drugs from a variety of pharmacological classes that produce perceptual distortions, hallucinations, and mystical experiences, for example. Uh, first, what we have, what we often refer to as the classic hallucinogens, uh, which include LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin, and other 5H2A receptor agonists. As you work down the list here on this slide, you'll see a variety of other classes of drugs with varying mechanisms of actions, uh, including indirect 5-HT2A agonists, such as MDMA. Uh, you'll see the NMDA ag antagonists, such as phencyclidine and ketamine, uh, the kappa opioid receptor agonists such as salvinorin A, uh, THC, which also has psychedelic properties, particularly once you start escalating to higher doses, and the anticholinergics such as the scopolamine and atropine. 
given the very large range of pharmacology and mechanisms of action of drugs with psychedelic properties, drug development needs to consider the unique properties of each drug, uh, what is known in the published literature about the drug, and what major data gaps need to be addressed in the drug development pro program for regulatory success. Next, please. A great deal of research has been conducted examining the potentially benef beneficial uh, effects of psychedelics. Research has shown the potential for these compounds to exhibit both neuroplastic and immunomodulatory effects and is exploring these compounds for the use of in various psychiatric and neurological disorders such as depression, anxiety and related disorders, substance use disorders, various types of headaches uh, and some neurological indications as well. Psychedelics can be both botanically derived or synthetically manufactured, or can be further chemically modified to create novel chemical entities. The type of derived molecule will have specific considerations from both a manufacturing perspective, as well as a drug development perspective and strategy. Dosing with psychedelic drugs varies depending on the target and can range anywhere from very low micro doses to high, higher dose ranges, depending on the indication and the population that's being considered. Uh, so we need to consider um, what the needs are. Considerations need to be given for acute administrations versus repeated dose administrations and how to best medically manage the potential psychoactive effects in study volunteers. Medical management uh, must be conducted with trained professionals in a pragmatic way. Uh, an establishment of an, not only an effective therapy, but also an efficient process by which to administer the therapy will be important considerations for successful drug development, but more so for effective use in the real world post-approval. Uh, so we're working with sponsors very closely to really look at the developing pragmatic plans to handle psychedelics in the clinical early phase drug development setting, which will be very important uh, as you move forward. Next slide, please. Psychedelics have had a tumultuous history in the United States. However, the potential therapeutic benefits have been noted for decades. Some psychedelics were previously approved for, the, in the, for use in the US, which included LSD, which was uh, medication sold <clears throat> for research purposes under the brand name Delicid in the 1950s and 1960s, as well as psilocybin, which was marketed as indocybin as an adjunct to psychotherapy. Uh, currently, these are both Schedule I substance, substances not currently approved for medical use in the United States. Next, please. The complete drug development cycle is shown here on this slide as per FDA requirements. As you move from the left to the right, you see the progression of drug development starting from drug discovery and preclinical development throughout, through to the three phases of clinical research. In blue, you have the regulatory milestones for filings, which include the IND submission and the final NDA submission, which ultimately determines drug approval. The progression from one phase to another is not definitively stepwise, and there's much overlap with the phases of development. For example, a human abuse potential study, a thorough QT, and other phase one studies often overlap with later phase two and three trials in clinical development, particularly because you need more data to be able to inform those types of study designs. Today, we will focus on the earlier phases of preclinical and phase one development and how to strategically design these studies to make the most informed decisions later in drug development. Next, please. In general, preclinical assessments will include evaluation of safety, pharmacology, and toxicity, most of which will be required to open an IND and commence clinical work, as well as abuse evaluation, noting that dependency evaluation may be waived for some compounds, depending on the pharmacology and whether or not they've already been, um, not, they're not associated with developing physical dependency, and also importantly, proof of concept. As you transition to the clinical development phase, this program will include safety, pharmacokinetics and efficacy, including the pharmacodynamic effects of the drug. The abuse and dependence potential evaluation will be evaluated as needed depending on the type of drug. And it should also consider the data that is already available in the published literature. For some, in some cases, dedicated studies will be required if there is no published data. Uh, so that will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Next, please. 
The FDA has several guidances for industry that can be helpful for the development of psychedelic drugs. These span various topics, including abuse potential, suicidality assessments, specific considerations for botanical drugs, and driving impairment. There are many other guidances available to further support methodology, manufacturing, and regulatory processes throughout the drug development cycle. Next slide, please. Drugs with abuse potential are scheduled and regulated under the Controlled Substances Act, uh, which it was established in 1970. This classifies drugs, including psychedelics, into five schedules that are based on whether or not a drug has current accepted medical use in the United States and its relative abuse potential and likelihood of causing dependence. Physical dependence, just to differentiate it from abuse, is a neuroadaptive process often characterized by the precipitation of withdrawal symptoms when a drug is abruptly discontinued that can occur in the presence or absence of abuse potential. So for example, SSRIs can cause physical dependence, but they don't, uh, they're not abused drugs per se. So that's not necessarily hand in hand. In contrast, abuse potential can also occur in the absence of physical dependence, uh, as will be the case for some drugs with psychedelic properties. Both can be independent factors that are tested using different methodologies. Next slide, please. Psychedelics typically will be scheduled according to their accepted medical use and relative abuse potential. Psilocybin, DMT, LSD, and MDMA sit in Schedule 1 uh, as they're currently not approved for medical use, whereas drugs such as ketamine and esketamine are designated as Schedule 3. Botanicals with psychedelic substances may not be currently scheduled under the Controlled Substances Act, but may be subject to other laws for controls. Some countries, including the U.S., have provisions for compassionate use for drugs in therapeutic settings. Irrespective, there are always regulatory concerns for the potential of such drugs to be abused, misused, or diverted, and therefore establishing a mitigation plan for such events is critical in both drug development and post-marketing stages. Next, please. This table illustrates the five schedules of the Controlled Substances Act. On the top row are Schedule 1 substances that do not have accepted medical use and may be used for research purposes only. This includes many of the psychedelic drugs you see listed in the column on the far right. During the drug approval process, the collected data, both investigational data and data available from the public domain, are evaluated to determine an appropriate scheduling status. Depending on the extent of signals suggestive of abuse potential, a drug may fall into various schedules. Some of the drugs shown here in bold have some hallucinogenic properties or psychedelic properties, and as you can see, vary in scheduling status. Next slide, please. Handling an, a controlled substance in a research setting requires licensing. To obtain licensing, sites must have appropriate controls in place for the storage and handling of those controlled substances. Both IND and IRB approved protocols are required for submission for each product. So to give you an, ex an example, for sites including ours that have an existing Schedule 1 license in place, the DEA review period takes typically between 4 and 12 weeks. However, one can expect considerable delays lasting 6 to 12 months for sites applying for their first license. State and local requirements must also be considered uh, as different requirements may be in place for those states. For example, California requires additional state notification for research using Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 controlled substances. So this is an important element to be determining when you're considering research sites. Next slide, please. I will now hand over the presentation to Dr. Ch Sharon Cheatham, who will discuss the preclinical requirements. Thank you, Beatrice. So I'm going to cover the preclinical assessment of the abuse risks associated with the psychedelics. And we're going to generally focus on those with their 5-HT mode of action. So the first level of evaluation is to determine if the new chemical entity chemical structure is related to known substances of abuse. For novel psychedelics, this is very probable 
especially if the new chemical entity has used chemical scaffolds from existing drugs. The drug candidate should be profiled in vitro for its affinity for a range of molecular targets that mediate the actions of known drugs of abuse. So novel psychedelics should be profiled against the serotonin receptors, the opioid receptors, the NMDA receptors, and the transporter sites, including 5-HT and uh, dopamine, as these are the molecular targets through which the psychedelics are postulated to have their therapeutic effects. The compounds should also be evaluated for their affinity for other abuse-related targets, and also for members of a particular receptor family, such as the serotonin receptors, including 2A, 2B and 2C receptors. And the reason for this is this may also reveal potential side effects. For example, the 5-HT2B agonists have potentially been associated with cardiac valvulopathy. Erwin profiling is also extremely helpful. This is a broad assessment of CS, CNS mediated effects via, via behavioural profiling and motor assessment in rats. It is a useful as compounds are tested across a wide range of doses from the pharmacological active to the toxicological. It can pick up specific behavioural signals associated with the psychedelics, for example, wet dog shakes, and general characteristics such as sedative, stimulant, and behaviourally neutral. And it can also assist with the choice of positive comparators. Next slide, please. So before we go on to the preclinical abuse assessment, I thought it would be useful just to cover some of the efficacy models. So if we're focusing on drugs that have a serotonergic mode of action, you can look at these serotonergic behaviours such as flattened posture, lower lip retraction, strobe tail, lateral head weaving, reciprocal forepaw treading, tremor, rigidity and hind limb abduction. But more commonly people focus on head twitches in mice and wet dog shakes in rats. These are useful models to demonstrate functional effects of the 5-HT2A agonists. So it, the mouse head twitches are a characteristic rotational movement of the head and ears occurring in the mice. And wet dog shakes are so named because the rotational response of the head transitions down the spine, resembling the action of a dog when they shake water from their coats. And this is seen in rats. So head twitches are often used to detect the hallucinogenic properties of some non-serotonergic psychedelics, such as the fencyclidines. So they are reasonably good predictive models of hallucinogenic potential. However, when you're evaluating novel compounds, it's important to know that there are the existence of both false positives, such as yohimbine, and false negatives, such as MDMA. You can also look at ex vivo binding, and this is the occupancy of receptors of interest, such as 5-HT2A receptors in the brain, and these can be correlated with behaviour and or DMPK, so plasma and or brain levels. And you can also use the drug discrimination as a model of a hallucinogenic activity, and we'll talk about that a little later. Next slide, please. So here we can see some head twitch model data. So here we see the number of head twitches induced by DOI at two doses, and you can clearly see a dose-related effect. At the end of the study, the brains were taken from the animals, and here we've looked at ex vivo 5-HT2A receptor occupancy, both looking at homogenate binding and autoradiography. And again, you can see a clear dose-related effect with the two doses of DOI. Next slide, please. So if we now move on to the preclinical assessment of abuse risks. The preclinical abuse dependence evaluation of new chemical entities explores three distinct aspects of risk. So the drug discrimination assesses whether the psychoactive effects of the new chemical entity are identical to or similar to those of a known substance of abuse. The intravenous self-administration looks at reinforcing effects, so that's psychological dependence or craving. So is the experience produced by taking the drug candidate either rewarding or reinforcing? Does it lead to drug seeking behavior? And physical dependence on withdrawal. So when the new chemical ed entity administration is stopped after repeated administration, does it produce physical dependence? 
Next slide, please. So if we focus on the drug discrimination testing first, this assesses if, if the compound is identical or similar to those of known substances of abuse. So if we look at the experimental design, testing takes place in two lever operant chambers. And the way we perform the studies is operant responding is rewarded by sweetened milk during training and also in testing sessions when using some of the abuse drugs as discriminative cues. So we start off with a fixed ratio schedule for food reinforcement, building up to five or 10 using a non-biased design. So we're using five or 10 lever presses on either lever to deliver rewards. So this model assesses whether the interceptive cue elicited by the new chemical entity is similar or identical to that of the abused drug used to train the rats. So how the uh, drug makes the animals feel. Next slide, please. So here we have some drug discrimination data using MDMA as the cue. So the animals are trained to distinguish MDMA from saline. And here we can see the percentage generalization to MDMA. And we have full generalization to MDMA at 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. We've then gone on to do a dose response to MDMA and DOI. And as you can clearly see, you get a full generalization at the highest doses. We've looked at dexfenfluramine, which is a 5-HT releasing agent, where you see partial generalization. We've looked at buspirone, which is a 5-HT1A partial agonist, where you do see some partial generalization, but this compound has no evidence of abuse. And we've looked at 5-HT and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, such as venlafaxine and cybutramine, which show no generalization. So this is a good model to look at generalization to MDMA for things like the 5-HT2A agonists. Next slide, please. So we've used MDM, MDMA Q drug discrimination because it Q cross generalizes with psychoactive effects of the intactogens, 5-HT2A receptor agonists and the serotonergic club drugs. The other thing the MDMA Q drug discrimination testing can also detect is the stimulant properties of the drug candidates. So this is a versatile and sensitive technique for detecting the psychoactive effects of a wide range of compounds that pose a risk for human abuse. You can also use PCP in the drug discrimination and pentazacin. Next slide, please. So if we move on to self-administration, this assesses the reinforcing potential of the new chemical entity. So the experimental design is rats are trained to leave a press for food pellets as a positive, positive reinforcer on an FR of reward schedule. After jugular characterization, rats are exposed to the training substance of abuse, again on an FR schedule of reinforcement. So after saline extinction, the new chemical entity is substituted to assess whether it will maintain self-administration at levels greater than saline. And an FR10 is the maximum schedule of drug reinforcement recommended in the FDA guidance. So the key points of the model it is it assesses positive reinforcement, that is reward. It doesn't reveal any information about the pharmacological class of the drug. The training drug maintains self-administration because its effects are rewarding, not because it's a stimulant or it's a sedative. And the results from the FR testing schedule are pretty much yes or no to the question. Does the new chemical entity serve as a positive reinforcer? Next slide, please. So what about intravenous self-administration studies with the 5-HT2A receptor agonists in animals? Well, there's a complicating factor in that the pharmacological tolerance develops to the effects of 5-HT2A receptor agonists in animals and humans which may be an issue in an experiment where animals are given repeated daily access to the drug. And the consensus view is that although 5-HT2A receptor agonists are abused by humans, animals do not find those psychoactive effects rewarding or reinforcing. And so the FDA recognized that 5-HT2A receptor agonists do not serve as reinforcers in animals. And in its guidance, it states that sponsors may approach the agency to seek a waiver for conducting IVSA experiments with drug candidates from this pharmacological class. 
Next slide, please. However, MDMA and some other indirect 5-HT2A agonists do serve as positive reinforcers in this model. And here we see the data for MDMA over a dose range of 0.025 to 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per injection in heroin maintained rats. And again, in the intravenous self-administration, you can use pentazacine and butorphanol, which will also look as a positive reinforcer. Next slide, please. And then finally, we have the potential of the new chemical entity to induce physical dependence. So the design should include a wide range of behavioral, physiological and physical signs that can detect physical dependence induced by drugs with different pharmacological mechanisms. And daily monitoring optimizes the ability to detect pharmacological tolerance. The duration of treatment should be sufficient to allow the development of neurochemical adaptation, so for around 28 days or more. And we're aiming to get exposure to, to around three times the maximum clinical dose. The new chemical entity should be evaluated in its own right. Induction of tolerance independence is related to a range of factors, such as rate of brain entry, duration of target occupancy, half-life, <laughs> metabolites, multiple pharmacological actions. It's not just a pharmacological class effect. And here, the role of the positive control is to validate the test. It's not there to serve as a direct comparator or to represent a particular pharmacological class. Next slide, please. So what about the liability of the psychedelic drugs to induce physical dependence? Well, as we've already said, the 5-HT2A receptor agonists produce rapid development of pharmacological tolerance, and there's no evidence of physical dependence on withdrawal. MDMA and serotonergic club drugs produce some degree of pharmacological tolerance. There's no evidence of physical dependence on withdrawal, and potentially there is a side effect issue of serotonergic neurotoxicity. And this is depletion of the serotonergic nerve terminals of 5H2. Next slide, please. So there are other considerations. These studies should be formed to GLP as the FDA require this. In terms of gender, we should use animals from both genders, not just male animals, as preclinical studies are generally performed in male animals. And so in-house, we tend to use female animals for drug discrimination, male for the intravenous self-administration, and perform the tolerance independence in both males and females. So what are the roles of the positive controls and the reference comparators? Well, the positive controls are to show that the models are actually working. The reference comparators are there to put your compound into perspective in comparison to other drugs of abuse. And finally, we need to consider DMPK. As drug abusers don't tend to take therapeutic doses, they tend to take multiples of the therapeutic dose. And certainly in the drug discrimination and the tolerance and dependence, we're aiming to get around three times the Cmax in, in the clinical setting. Next slide, please. So in summary, novel psychedelic drugs for medicinal use will have to undergo rigorous preclinical assessments to determine the abuse and dependence risks that they carry. Information from the scientific literature and our own research indicates that psychedelic drugs pose specific technical challenges when evaluating their preclinical abuse and dependence potential. But based on current evidence, the abuse risks posed by the psychedelics are no greater or more onerous than those associated with the class II opioids or stimulants. I'll now hand back to Beatrice. Thank you, Sharon. And now I will cover clinical development for psychedelic drugs. Next, okay. The critical first step to starting a clinical drug development program is the evaluation of safety and ensuring that subjects participating in drug trials are appropriately monitored for safety. 
while some of the classical hallucinogens may have limited physiological effects, it is important to remember that phase one studies often include dose ranging exploration, which may include high doses of the investigational drug. Ensuring appropriate monitoring for safety, safety, including cardiovascular effects such as QT prolongation, tachycardia, changes in blood pressure, and respiratory depression are important and require a facility that has those continuous monitoring capabilities. Uh, so having a site that's well trained on the safety monitoring is, is going to be essential. The more prevalent adverse reactions with hallucinogens will likely be related to psychiatric events where a highly specialized site may be needed to ensure appropriate medical oversight and medical management of severe psychiatric events such as psychosis. Uh, appropriate evaluation of suicidality, impairment, and persistent effects following drug discontinuation are also important considerations depending on the duration of exposure of subjects in the clinical trial. Since many target po patient populations will likely use the investigational drug concomitantly with other prescribed drugs in the real world setting or in the clinical setting, an evaluation of drug and alcohol interactions are important for determining the potential impact of such interactions on drug efficacy and safety. Uh, so having a site that is also versed in the medical management of the psychiatric events one would anticipate is also going to be an important element uh, and certainly site Sites that have the um, that follow the good clinical practice guidelines and the ICH, which is the International Conference on Harmonization, uh, will be important because those will be the regulatory requirements that will be needed for successful submissions of those types of studies. The uh, next slide, please. The ensuring safe clinical practices with hallucinogens begins with thoughtful subject screening. So, so it all starts there. In particular, it is important to exclude subjects who may be vulnerable to adverse events in the clinical trial. Uh, so for example, for studies with healthy volunteers, exclusion criteria should include considerations of current, past, or family history uh, in first or second degree relatives of schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders, uh, exclusion of other psychiatric conditions that may be present, uh, adverse events that may be inadvertently misattributed to hallucinogen action, for example, comp com compulsive, obsessive compulsive disorder or a dissociative or disorder or a panic type disorder. Uh, these should also be considered. So in, 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 taking into account the inclusion exclusion criteria uh, will be very important in proactively mitigating additional risks that may occur. Uh, other excluding factors should take into account physiological and general health status, for example, defining a healthy blood pressure range and restricting the use of concomitant medications and dietary supplements that may interfere with the investigational drug. Uh, when designing studies for the targeted popula patient population, the inclusion-exclusion criteria uh, may need to be modified based on the expected pathology and the use of concomitant medications in that particular patient group. Uh, so that has to be carefully evaluated. One does need to look at the pharmacology of the drug, um, as well as the expected interactive effects that it may have if you're dealing with patients, and they may be taking it con concomitantly with SSRIs or SNRIs or other types of study medications. Determining drug safety without the confounders of pathology is most easily achieved typically using normal healthy volunteer populations, and this is why you see many early phase studies in normal healthy volunteers. Depending on the assessments performed and objectives of the studies, hallucinogen experienced subjects may be preferred over hallucinogen naive subjects, uh, and this is part of the uh, care for the subjects as part of the clinical trial to ensure that they have um, some experience with hallucinogens or psychedelic drugs so that they're not uh, panicked when if they have perceptual changes that they may have not been ever exposed to. So in some cases, it may be very beneficial to have a population with hallucinogen experience, and other times you may want to look at naive subjects depending on the objectives of the study. Additional assessments to determine any negative moods prior to administration may also be an important method to address potential negative drug effects. In all studies, uh, appropriate informed consent must be obtained and subjects must be prepared to understand the potential perceptual changes that may occur in an unbiased fashion. Uh, and this is very typical of CROs with ICH guidelines. You'd be providing informed consent and navigating the subjects through what 
the anticipated effects of the drugs would be. Uh, and there are other ways to mitigate and make the subjects more comfortable in that environmental setting. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, here are some recommendations for how to configure the clinical setting for these types of drugs. So when you're conducting early phase studies, utilizing a site that is highly trained in administering CNS active drugs of a variety of different indications. And the reason I say that is because some of these new analogs of these hallucinogens may have very different profiles and having a, a varied experience with different CNS active drugs and the ability to mitigate those adverse effects becomes very important. Uh, and we mentioned the compliance with both the ICH and the good clinical practices is essential for your regulatory success downstream. Uh, sites uh, must have well-trained staff and have equipment and facilities suitable for these types of studies and an environment for CNS active drugs in case there are effects such as um, dizziness or uh, loss of balance or other uh, kinds of CNS effects that could re uh, result in injury to a subject. So you want to be very careful and you want to have safe environment in place. Appropriate safety equipment would include uh, instrumentation such as EEGs, telemetry, crash carts for emergency interventions. Uh, you need a safe and enriched environment uh, for subject safety. We, we always use single beds and avoid bunk beds, particularly because for CNS drugs that might cause dizziness or disorientation or some kind of drunken feeling. Uh, you don't want to have subjects that uh, could injure themselves in, in the setting. So this is all the, the detail is very important in the clinical environment. The clinical environment that's comfortable and can be controlled for privacy, environmental factors such as lighting and noise, which you will see is very important in controlling for psychedelic drugs, uh, can be very helpful to mitigate some of those adverse events. And staff must be trained and qualified to administer pharmacodynamic and cognitive testing and in providing appropriate medical oversight and adverse event monitoring. Um, our clinic, uh, we have it run by our principal investigator, by a psychiatrist and, and clinical neuropsychologists that are able to put together protocols and specific guidelines for clinic staff to follow uh, to administer drugs that have a, a unique adverse event profile, for example. Lastly, a secure facility where subjects can be observed uh, safely is critical. Uh, so CROs such as ours that routinely conduct studies for regulatory submissions are highly experienced and can ensure study execution and data capture that meets the regulatory requirements. Uh, and the data capture and presentation of that data is also important on the back end for uh, eventual submissions to the FDA. Uh, next slide, please. When developing CNS active drugs, the strategic inclusion of pharmacodynamic measures early in the drug development process can be beneficial to assess the pharmacology and safety of a drug. And there are various domains of interest and ones that are particularly relevant to drugs with psychedelic properties. Uh, so for example, there are several measures that examine hallucinations and perceptual changes, including measures such as the Baudel visual analog scales, uh, the mystical experience questionnaire, uh, there are a variety of different VAST scales and other questionnaires that can assay various psychiatric related events, including um, parameters such as anxiety, aggression, relaxation, mood changes, just to, to give a few examples. There are a variety of cognitive and psychomotor tests that can be applied to test various domains related to attention, processing speed, memory, uh, to determine if a drug can cause either impairing or enhancing effects, very important from a safety consideration. Uh, such testing can be applied to both the healthy volunteers in these studies as well as the patient populations as appropriate. Uh, it's important to determine, um, a customize, customize a questionnaire if needed to be appropriate and valid for the population and conditions in the study. So oftentimes questionnaires need to be tweaked a little bit uh, to fit the study design. Next slide, please. The safety and data integrity uh, in a study are always the key considerations for a clinical trial design. To control for the subjective reporting of adverse events and pharmacodynamic testing, including the appropriate controls to be used, treatment blinding and randomization of treatments are critical to control for elements such as responder bias and uh, to ensure the ability to interpret the data at the end of the day. So those must be given careful thought as you're planning the study and the study objectives. Depending on the nature of the study and its objective, 
uh, placebo controls may be considered. In addition, some studies may also require active controls to evaluate the extent, for example, of a pharmacodynamic effect or for comparative safety evaluations. Historic controls have included drugs such as scopolamine, ketamine, high doses of THC, high doses of dextromethorphan for studies that have examined pharmacodynamic effects, for example. Uh, consideration uh, will also be given for crossover versus parallel studies, which can impact sample size to a large degree. Parallel studies may be more pragmatic if uh, you have a lengthy duration of treatment or have very long washout periods. Uh, adverse event collection that is generally comprehensive, not le uh, non-leading in terms of you're not uh, suggesting to a, a subject if they're feeling a certain way, they should be unbiased in terms of their collection. And that's very, very important. Uh, and accounts for uh, the adverse collection that accounts for patient verbatim terms is very important in the end of the day for interpretation. Uh, for compounds that have abuse potential, particular attention will be made for adverse events related to the abuse potential. So including any reports of abuse, misuse, overdose, or instances of aberrant pill counts in cases of studies where take-home medication or dose is given um, to determine possible links to drug diversion. Uh, needless to say, any clinical study must have a risk mitigation strategy to manage any of those such potential events. Next slide, please. If there is accumulating evidence from your clinical data that suggests the potential for driving impairment, a dedicated driving st study may be required by the regulatory agencies. And such dr dedicated driving studies may have higher face validity compared to more general tests of CNS function and are conducted with validated paradigms utilizing either actual motor vehicles or driving simulators. Uh, the driving simulators shown here on the picture uh, on the right at our Montreal clinical facility. Uh, there are a variety of different driving tests that are utilized depending on the drug action and whether there may be impairing, enhancing, or other effects such as impulsivity or risk-taking expected as a result of the drug exposure and noting how that may affect patient safety. Next slide, please. Centrally acting drugs have varying effects on driving performance. For example, there is varying sensitivity to sedation across a wide range of medications as shown in the table, which presents the standard deviation of lateral position change from placebo, which is the primary endpoint in a driving simulator study. So if you think about it, it's the kind of the swerving or the sway from the center line as you're driving. The more swerving or the greater the SDLP, the more of an erratic driving pattern that's observed or an increased impaired result. Uh, these results here are pooled from six independent studies. As you go from the top to the bottom of the list, you'll see an increase in the impairing effects of the drug in relation to the primary endpoint. Uh, from the table, uh, from the table, you can see that a drug such as flibanserin actually shows an improvement in driving relative to placebo, whereas drugs as such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, other sedatives, and muscle relaxants show more pronounced impairing effects, as as we all know them to be. Uh, drugs such as ketamine, for example, have also shown to significantly, significantly impair driving performance and hence with the dissociatives or pro drugs with psychedelic properties, these will be also important considerations throughout drug development. Next slide, please. Abuse potential will also be a very important safety evaluation for psychedelics and will be critical in determining their scheduling status at the time of drug approval. The human abuse potential study evaluates the likability of a drug in a face valid population, which is compromised of non-dependent recreational drug users. And when I say non-dependent, I mean not physically dependent on drugs. Uh, for psychedelics, this will require a population of drug users who have past experience with perception altering drugs. And it's extremely important to ensure appropriate requirements for this population as some psychedelics are not as prevalent in availability in the streets compared to commonly used drugs such as marijuana, opioids, and stimulants, for example. So selecting criteria that is too strict or requires frequent psychedelic use may unnecessarily limit your ability to recruit eligible participants and result in very costly delays to your program. Uh, ensuring that an experienced site reviews or helps draft your study protocol can greatly assist in developing a pragmatic study design that's not only scientifically and medically sound, but that's also operationally feasible. 
Uh, these studies are conducted as single center, double blind crossover studies that uh, include both a placebo and one or more active controls. And those are selected based on the pharmacology of the investigational drug. Prior to the randomization to treatment, subjects will undergo a pharmacological challenge and careful screening to confirm that they are not physically dependent on drugs and that they are able to tolerate the active control as well as discriminate the active control from placebo on the primary and key secondary endpoints of the study. Uh, so we don't just take into account their recreational drug using history. They need to demonstrate that they're able to tell the differences between the active control and the placebo. Next slide, please. Human abuse potential studies evaluate the subjective effects of an investigational drug as it relates to the drug effects that are desirable and sought after for non-medical or recreational purposes. Uh, these studies will also include negative drug effects, which can limit the pleasure of a drug and impairing effects on cognition as well. The primary endpoint that's typically used in these studies is the um, drug liking scale, which is presented on a zero to 100 point visual analog scale shown here on the computerized testing tablet in this image. The question states, at this moment, my liking for the drug is, and the subject responds to this by moving the cursor along the line towards either strong disliking on the left, neutral in the middle where they neither like nor dislike, which is typically what you see for a placebo response, or if they like it, they move it relative towards the degree of strong liking to the right, depending on the extent of how they're feeling. The greater the feeling, the closer to the anchor the response is made, and that gets recorded as a score. Next slide, please. Now we will turn over to a case study that demonstrate how well-structured studies evaluating CNS drug effects can inform the product prescribing information. Today's case study is Spravato, a sketamine nasal, nasal spray, which is a dissociative and was recently approved in 2019 for use in conjunction with an oral antidepressant for the treatment of treatment resistant depression in adults. The structure of the prescribing information uh, or drug label in the US is the same template for each drug. Sections that are not applicable can be revised or removed. And knowing the structure of the prescribing information and how it's utilized for drugs for similar indications as your target indication or for drugs with similar pharmacology can help you develop your target pro product profile, which is sort of your roadmap for future clinical development as you go throughout the process. The uh, first part of this is examining, when we examine this Spravato label, uh, can help illustrate how informative study data is from early phase trials and can be included in the product information. So for example, here on this slide, you're seeing section 5.7. And in this section, the, the results from a study examining short-term cognitive impairment comparing Spravato to placebo are summarized in this particular section. Other sections of the Spravato label include section 5.7 one, which addresses expected sedation, section 5.2, which addresses dissociation. Uh, in this section, the label notes that the most common psych psychological effects of Spravato were dissociative or perceptual changes, including distortion of time, space, and illusions, realization, and personalization. Careful assessment of patients with psychosis prior to administration of Spravato should be made. So these are always very helpful uh, safety information for both the prescriber as well as the patient. Next slide, please. Also summarized in the Spravato label are the results of two placebo-controlled studies that evaluated driving performance. One was conducted in healthy subjects, the other in adult patients with major depressive disorder. Section 5.8 of the label specifically addresses the ability to drive and operate heavy machinery and provides relevant safety information to, again, both the prescriber and patient not to engage in potentially hazardous activities requiring complete mental alertness and motor coordination, such as driving a motor vehicle or operating machinery, until the next day following a restful sleep. So there's always some guidance provided based on the clinical data that was, that's been obtained. Next slide, please. 
Section nine of the prescribing information provides details related to drug abuse and dependence. Um, as you can see here, Spravato is a schedule three controlled substance and has noted abuse potential as detailed in this section. And in, in these sections and the label will also be data from the human abuse potential studies. If we go to the next slide. The results of the human abuse potential study are detailed in section 9.2. The data from the study comparing intranasal esketamine to both intravenous ketamine and placebo are described here and including the side effects that were noted. The next slide uh, goes over physical dependence potential of a drug, and this is typically captured in section 9.3 of any given prescribing information label. And as you can see here, the label states that physical dependence has been reported with prolonged use of ketamine. Uh, this section is informative in providing additional details related to the types of withdrawal symptoms that may be expected if a patient suddenly discontinues or decreases their dose abruptly. And it provides information for mitigating withdrawal. So again, this is a very important safety section that informs both the patient and prescriber. Um, the, furthermore, this section also will address uh, any reports of the possibility of developing tolerance to a drug with prolonged use so that it's, it's uh, known in advance to both the patient and the prescriber. And next slide. At the time of the NDA filing for drug approval, abuse and dependence potential is evaluated by the FDA and several other agencies. Ultimately, it is the Drug Enforcement Agency or the DEA who decides on the scheduling class. Data that is reviewed in its entirety includes all the data starting from the chemistry studies, preclinical studies, all and throughout all of the clinical studies. Um, our team, for example, will assist many sponsors in identifying important data points across the development program and helps to organize these submissions for eight factor evaluations. Uh, and this occurs, this work is a, an ongoing evaluation and being able to identify what's going to be important at the end of the day will help you design studies better and also proactively look for signals throughout the development program and have far more informed conversations with the FDA during your regulatory milestone meetings. Uh, next slide, please. This, this is an outline of the eight-factor analysis that's utilized by the FDA to provide a recommendation for scheduling. Taking a proactive approach in evaluating your investigational drug throughout the drug development program will ensure that you have sufficient and compelling data to support your scheduling recommendation when submitting your NDA because the sponsor is required to put in a scheduling recommendation uh, as they're putting in their package to submitting it to the FDA. So being able to evaluate that data yourselves and putting a, a reasonable recommendation, it will go a long way. And I think our final slide will give us an, a summary. And in summary, the CNS drugs, including those with psychedelic properties, require unique risk benefit evaluations that may not pertain to other drug classes. Uh, one must be strategic with the development path, as well as in choosing the correct partners for conducting research. Uh, study or clinic sites must have licenses for handling and storing controlled substances, as well as ample experience in administering drugs of this class. Uh, furthermore, psychedelics themselves have unique properties that require specific considerations for safety and clinical environment, including highly experienced and trained staff. The conduct uh, of well-designed trials early in development can strategically characterize the pharmacology of your drug and can provide important data to determine if further dedicated studies will be needed down the road. And those could include dedicated driving studies, evaluations of physical dependency, uh, and whether or not the, those types of studies will be required or waived. In certain cases, uh, data may be derived from published literature. Uh, furthermore, determining the safety profile of the drug will provide relevant data to ensure patient safety as you progress to larger phase two and phase three trials. Uh, lastly, the understanding the um, the ability to um, the elements of the eight factor analysis and how this needs to be proactively examined throughout your drug development program is critical for the eventual scheduling of the psychedelic drug. And as you've seen earlier, the psychedelics fall into a variety of different classes depending on their unique pharmacology. Uh, partnering with a research sites uh, such as Alpha Sciences and Signature, uh, we have this expertise that can be very beneficial uh, for evaluating that throughout the course of your 
your drug development cycle. Uh, so at this point, Dr. Cheatham and I would like to thank you for your attendance today. This concludes our presentation. We will now be happy to answer any questions uh, brought forward by our audience today. So thank you very much. And uh, Dr. and uh, Sharon, if, if you're on the line, we can walk through some of the questions we've received. And uh, we'll start off with uh, first question, what is a thorough QT, QT prolongation? So these are uh, these types of studies are conducted uh, during the, if there are signals indicative that a drug may be causing delays in cardiac repolarization. And these are safety studies. Uh, oftentimes sponsors will include a, a more thorough QT evaluation in their first in human studies and hold on to that data to determine if they're, if they're there may be a requirement for conducting a dedicated study or waiving it, uh, but it's, it's a, these are essential cardiac safety studies. So in some cases, they may or may not be required depending on what the drug does on cardiac physiology. Uh, the next question is, uh, has there been any progress with the DEA timelines for new licenses and what can sites do to help minimize delays? And this is sort of tied into the following question. Um, hello, Mark. Nice to see you on the line. Uh, do you have experience or guidance related to the import of Schedule One products in the U to the U.S., in particular, which stakeholders need DEA licenses, drug product manufacturers, packaging vendors, distributors? So, um, yeah, the DEA license, I, is certainly if, you, if you're already dealing with a site that has licenses in place, uh, having your regulatory approvals, your IRB approvals, having everything organized will certainly help minimize any types of delays. If you're applying for a license for the very first time, uh, there are audits and there are a lot of hurdles to jump through because you need to have the site that's configured for the, the storage and handling of, um, of the controlled substance. Uh, so that, that's a bit of a more of a complex uh, question on that one. Uh, and we can probably take that offline if, if you'd like to have more details around how to prepare for, for having to, to do a license on an individual study. Whenever you're, whether you're a manufacturer, packaging, vendor, distributor, if you're handling the drug, if you're receiving it and handling it, the, the licensing will need to be in place. And that does include manufacturers as well. And uh, any additional details around that, if you have specific questions, we're happy to connect with you offline and talk more about specific needs that you may have around handling the Schedule 1 and the importation of it. Um, but there are, um, but of course, it is possible to import uh, Schedule 1's products into the U.S. Uh, the next question that came in is, can you comment about possible roles of other 5-HT receptors for driving efficacy other than the 5-HT2 family? Um, Sharon, I had some thoughts on that. I don't know if, if you have um, anything that you wanted to add, uh, but there are certainly other uh, 5-HT receptor mediated actions that depending on the function could potentially have efficacy in, in various areas. And Sharon, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on any, any of that. So there's really limited evidence that on their own, other 5-HT receptors. So for example, 5-HT1 receptor agonists are actually hallucinogenic in their own right. But the evidence is that they play more of a modulatory effect. So if you look at the animal evidence, there is some evidence that the 5-HT1A receptors are involved in the sort of a hallucinogenic effects that um, are mediated by LSD. So I think it's quite complicated. Obviously, the 5-HT2A and receptors in the family are, are, are the big drivers of the effect. But I think potentially the evidence at the moment is more modulatory. But a complete systematic review of the 5-HT receptors and their roles just isn't available at the moment. I think that will become apparent as new compounds do become available to actually, um, you know, with psychedelic activity and, and, and the balance of the receptor profile will become more apparent. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Our next question, and, and I think certainly uh, to, just to add to that, I, I, you know, it really depends on what efficacy uh, you're looking at, uh, because I think they'll have, you'll, you'll see that different receptors will have mediate different 
effects. Uh, so when you look at some of the 5H21A, for example, uh, they can function on a lot of different uh, physiological effects. So it really depends on what type of efficacy you're targeting for, for a drug and what could be mediating that. Uh, we also have uh, many compounds will bind uh, not only to one receptor, but may be binding to different receptors and they may be you know, partial agonists, antagonists, so that they may be a mixed function. Uh, so I think there's uh, probably more interesting research to be done uh, more concisely in this field uh, and certainly looking at, I know that there are groups that are interested in looking at um, utilizing the, the the efficacy traits of a psychedelic without necessarily producing some of the psychedelic properties. So if, if that comes to fruition, that would be an interesting approach as well. Uh, the next question are, uh, asks, what are the ideal credentials to look for in a PI that would conduct these trials? Are there any specific requirements in training or certification? So um, essentially, when you're looking for an investigator and a site generally, it would be important to have uh, a team that is well-versed in handling CNS uh, adverse effects. And those could be things like psych uh, paranoia, um, panic, uh, sometimes even psychosis we've observed in the clinics and having a mitigation staff that are able to uh, mitigate those types of events and, and having an environment in which you can control and, and uh, if you had to isolate a subject that has a potential configuration for doing that. Uh, for training and requirements, uh, we are developing training modules for uh, specifically for psych psychedelics, but whenever you're administering pharmacodynamic measures, that requires training for both the, the investigators and the staff that are administering that, as well as for subjects to be able to understand those measures. So there's also specific training required on that pharmacodynamic evaluation. Uh, so there's, uh, there's more details. And if you have specific questions around a particular study objective, we can help answer that further in terms of what would be required depending on what your um, measurements are being conducted in the study. Uh, the next question, uh, do you take FDA guidance, and Sharon, I think this one will be for you. Do you take FDA guidance surrounding exemptions from IV self-administration testing in psychedelics as a class-wide signal of a comparatively lower overall risk of abuse? Is this a red herring? So in terms of looking at the guidance, I think the guidance really is very specific to the 2A agonists. And I think I wouldn't actually not do a self-administration study unless you had spoken really to uh, the CSS or the FDA and got their approval not to do those studies. So you really need to get an exemption. And that's very clear. It says you can get an exemption. You need to approach them and ask them. For the other psychedelics, so say the NMDA antagonist, the kappa opioid, uh, agonist, uh, you won't get an exemption because there are, you know, cues that you can use. You can use pentazepine, you can use PCP. So it really is very, very specific. And, and I think it's very specific in the guidance. You need to actually seek an exemption. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, to what aspects is tolerance to the psychedelics analogs developed? Are there any behaviors that result in sensitization from chronic psychedelic administration to your knowledge? Um, Sharon, if you, if you want to partially address, I mean, we see a lot of tolerance, for example, in classes of drugs such as opioids where the, the, it's certainly an, a physiological adaptation, a homeostasis that occurs to a drug. And, and sometimes some drugs are more pronounced than others in, in, in determining that degree of tolerance. Uh, but what you see is usually a increasing in dose over time because the effectiveness or the efficacy of the drug sort of wanes at that dose level. And then there's a need to escalate or to, to sometimes even change the, the therapeutic approach. Um, so this is really, um, the, the kind of behaviors that result in it, uh, well, I'd, it's more of a physiological adaptation. Uh, Sharon, I don't know if you if you had anything to, to add to that. So when you do the studies in animals, you do a whole range of behaviors. So you're looking at around about 40 to 50 individual behaviors. You're looking at 
um, things like body temperature, you're looking at food and water intake, body weight, that sort of thing. And you can get sensitization to any of these. But one of the things that happens really with the 5-HT2A agonist is obviously you get sensitized, you know, you get tolerance to the head twitches and that sort of behavior and the serotonergic behaviors. And you can see that quite clearly. But there are other aspects of that. And if you do these very, very carefully, you can pick up some very subtle effects as well. Um, and then you can then withdraw the drug and you can look at these factors. So, it, you know, it, it is a very rigorous sort of uh, model that you can look at. And, I, and again, I think because these compounds haven't really had any medical use, a systematic evaluation as there has been done for things like the opioids and things like that just doesn't really exist. And I think that's going to come with time. Um, as new chemical entities are developed. So I think, you know, we have some limited evidence, but if you actually look in the literature mm. for a whole range of the preclinical studies and look for these, the data, it's really focusing on things like head twitches, wet dog shakes. So those very behavioral things that are associated with the hallucinogenic activity, there'll be much more subtle effects, which we'll see as, you know, more studies mm -hmm. are done. Yes. And I've just been uh, told that we are past our hour and there are quite a lot of other questions that have come through. And I wanted to thank you for your uh, participation and for your attendance this afternoon. We will get to all your questions offline. Uh, so if you, we didn't have a chance to answer it today, we will uh, be in touch. And I'd like to also offer the invitation. If, you if you're developing a psychedelic or any CNS active drug and you'd like to have more information specifically about how these studies are conducted or if you have specific questions about the types of measures or something specific, we're happy to have some offline conversations with you directly. So if you could, uh, you have our contacts here for both Alta Sciences and for Signature Discovery, uh, any specific additional questions that come up, or if you'd like to have a, a complimentary consultation uh, regarding your specific product, uh, please feel free to, to connect with us. We will also be getting in touch with everyone else who left questions through the chat room this afternoon and helping to answer the remaining questions. So thank you you very much. Uh, we will be having additional webinars in this series and we will certainly be sending out invitations to everyone uh, for uh, any upcoming events that we hold on these topics. Thank you again.